Revive, my name is Jamie, and we are so glad that you are here tonight. I'm the Revive Young Adult Minister at Hope's West Des Moines campus, where we are broadcasting to you from, and we're so excited that you're here. My name is Chris Kimston. I'm the Young Adult Missions Minister from Lutheran Church of Hope, Des Moines, and uh, we've been praying for you. We don't believe that it's any accident that you're here. And I'm Ashley Lentz. I head up a Revive at our Ankeny campus with a whole bunch of other things that are super fun that I get to do there. And we have been collaborating for the month of September, the three revives to celebrate the 10th birthday of Revive and our decade defining decision series. So we're just so glad that you have joined us tonight and are taking time out of your life to learn about Jesus, invest in your relationship with him and hang out with us. Yep, so we're gonna get into the Bible reading and the message here and then some worship. We invite you to stand, sit, kneel, like do whatever you want to engage with this. And then we'll be back for announcements at the very end. We're really excited about them. So stay tuned, we'll see you soon. Today's reading comes from 2 Corinthians chapter three, verses 11 through 13, 17 and 18. So if the old way, which has been replaced, was glorious, how much more glorious is the new, which remains forever? Since this new way gives us such confidence, we can be very bold. We are not like Moses, who put a veil over his face so the people of Israel would not see the glory, even though it was destined to fade away. For the Lord is the Spirit, and wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. Here ends the reading. Hello and welcome to Revive. It is so great to be here with you all. We are tag teaming a message tonight as we are in our uh, Decade Defining Decisions series. We have talked about disastrous decisions and difficult decisions. And now we are talking about daring decisions for our 10th birthday party celebration. And with our Bible reading for tonight, if you want to open to 2 Corinthians with me, I think this is why uh, daring, bold decisions are so important. Uh, part of our verses from the Bible reading, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, I'm going to begin in verse 12. Since this new way gives us such confidence, we can be very bold. We are not like Moses who put a veil over his face so the people of Israel would not see the glory, even though it was destined to fade away. I'm going to jump down to verse 17. For the Lord is the spirit and wherever the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And Chris is going to talk a little bit about Moses here in a second. But I want you to know that bold, daring decisions are something of God. That's something that he has called us to. And we don't have to live in an old way of fear um, or of Comfort, comfort's actually, uh, it's comfortable because it's not daring. And so we don't have to live in this little box and assume that that's where we belong because God has so much more in store for us. And so let's talk about tonight uh, how we make daring decisions and what that looks like in some biblical examples uh, that we can follow. So I wanna talk about Ruth. Ruth is in the Old Testament, just a small little book. I think it's like four chapters. Uh, but if we remember Ruth, Ruth is this young woman whose uh, husband dies and she has, her family has moved from their hometown and they had moved because of a famine. And Ruth's husband dies and actually her father-in-law dies too. So it's Ruth and her mother-in-law and her sister-in-law and they're all widowed. And the mother-in-law says, you know what, I have to go back to my hometown because there's nothing for me in this place we've moved to. So, uh, you, you girls, Ruth, uh, Ruth and her sister-in-law, go back to your own families. And Ruth says, no. Ruth says, Naomi, I want to go to your hometown with you. And this is like super against worldly standards at this time. If you were a widowed woman, you essentially had nothing and you had to go back to your original family because they were the ones who supported you. And Ruth said, actually, Naomi, mother-in-law, I want to go with you. And so how do we make bold decisions when the world is against us or when the world is going to judge us for that decision. And Ruth makes this decision and she goes uh, back to the hometown with her mother-in-law and God works through this decision in miraculous and really mighty ways. And I will tell you about that in just a second. But I want you to think about a time when you've maybe had to make a really daring, bold decision or maybe a decision that you are currently facing 
and you're just not sure what's on the other side of that. Uh, one of those decisions for me was going to seminary school three years ago. I would have been starting seminary school just three years ago. And every person on this stage has been in or is in seminary school. And that is a bold and daring decision. Mm -hmm. And if I speak for all of us, quite uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, I felt mm -hmm. super unequipped. I had no idea what I was doing. And it was one of those things where I felt the nudge, like God was saying, this is something of me. This is a bold decision, Ashley, that I want you to step forward in, even though I was super clueless and really uncomfortable with what was ahead. But God works those things out for his good. He says, I have promised that your life is going to be fulfilled when you lean into my promises. And when you make bold and daring decisions, God honors those things. And at this point, I want to say a quick note about the difference between faithful, bold decisions and foolish, bold decisions. Now, here's the caveat. If you've ever made a foolish, bold decision, you're not alone and God will still work through that foolish, bold decision. It is, it's not something to be ashamed of. It's not something to hide. Uh, but when we are, when a bold decision is in front of us, when we are walking into a bold decision, it is really important to ask ourselves, is this a faithful, bold decision that we're making? Or is this maybe a foolish, bold decision that we should probably not make? And that takes discernment and it takes prayer and it takes community to make those decisions with other people who are going to pray for you and support you in whatever way you go with that decision. And when Naomi and Ruth go back to their hometowns, Ruth says to her mother-in-law, Naomi, in uh, Ruth chapter 1, verse 16, Ruth replied back to Naomi. She said, don't ask me to leave you and turn back. Wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. There was something about this God that Naomi worshiped that Ruth wanted. Ruth knew that going back to Bethlehem with her, with her mother-in-law was, was something God was nudging her to do. She knew there was something really amazing there. And the story ends in a really cool way. So Ruth actually ends up marrying this guy named Boaz, and they have a child. And Ruth becomes the great-great-grandmother of King David. And maybe you're wondering, okay, why does that matter? Ruth, Boaz, King David. Okay, Jesus Christ comes from the line of King David. So if Ruth didn't make this decision to go with Naomi and marry this guy named Boaz, like all these things fall into place, the line of Jesus would look different. Mm -hmm. I'm sure God still would have found a way to put Jesus on this earth, but Ruth was a really big part of that. And when she stepped forward in that bold, daring decision, God honored that decision and his promise to, to his people to bring them a savior. God worked his like everything through this decision that she made. And God has that promise to you too. When we honor God in our bold, daring decisions, God's ready to, to honor those decisions and walk with you in them. And who knows what is on the other side of that really bold, maybe tough decision that the world might judge and the world might say, that's not the way you're supposed to do that. Uh, with seminary school, I was actually told that I should not, as a woman, be going to seminary school. Maybe that's a big reason I actually went to seminary school, was to be like, watch me. <laughs> but it was one of those things where it, that's not, the, in a lot of places, that's not something that the world would say is okay. And God had a different plan. And there was that little nudge that was like, hey, this is a bold decision. This is a daring decision. It's not going to feel comfortable. People might talk about it. Uh, but God promises to work through it. And he has so much grace and goodness on the other side of those daring decisions. Absolutely. Now, as Ashley said, one of these things that we're trying to figure out, uh, these difficult lines that we kind of have to manage, is if a decision is daring in a positive way, aka a faithful decision, or whether it's daring in a negative way, aka a foolish decision, whether it's a faithful or foolish decade-defining decision. <laughs> We're really into alliteration. Like, that's just like a thing that we like a lot, apparently. But you see, sometimes we have a tendency, and this is all of us, uh, all of us on stage in including, uh, that sometimes we label foolish decisions as faithful decisions because we're trying to uh, justify and convince ourselves that the thing that we want to do is the right thing. 
We do that all the time. And uh, sometimes the opposite is also true. If we know that something that we should do, but we really don't want to, you're like, it's probably wisest if I don't. Like we, we <laughs> confuse what we should do with what we want to do all the time. And uh, Jamie and I talked about last week, there are times when the exact right decision is right there in front of you. You know exactly what it's supposed to be, but that decision is a really difficult one to make for lots of different reasons. Now, one of the most prevalent examples of trying to do this, like argue yourself out of a daring good decision, has to do with our insecurities. You see, what happens is we say to ourselves, listen, I know that someone needs to do fill in the blank, but it, obviously it can't be me. I'm not good enough at fill in the blank. I'm not skilled enough. I don't have the correct experience. I'm not just the right person for that. I'm not fill in the blank enough. Whatever that is for you, it happens to all of us. Those are the excuses that we make. We see this all the time in ministry. I'm speaking for myself, but I know it's probably true for the both of you as well, that um, people come up and they say, guys, listen, I have this great idea. You guys should start a ministry where you do fill in the blank, like where you start a Bible study about the sermon from the weekend, or you like, oh, like, what if we're really passionate about doing this, re and then they list a really specific thing that is obviously a passion point, or a hobby, or like a skill of theirs, <laughs> like, you guys should just like do that, I would love that, and then, I, I, again, I can't speak for either of them, but if you've ever done any of that, if you've ever come to talk to me about it, or almost any hope leader, they've, we've all likely said the same thing as, man, that's such a good idea, you should definitely lead that. And the funniest thing is we see the, the, the best facial expressions after that. People get so surprised, like, <laughs> me? I should do that? No, 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 no. Like, I'm not the right person to do that. Now, sometimes that comes from a place of wanting to be spiritual consumers instead of spiritual contributors. You just want to come in and you don't, you just, you don't really want to give anything. You just, like, want to kind of absorb it. But, and that can be part of the problem, but Honestly, for so many of us, a lot of the time it's because you really want to help, you really want to partake in, in ministry, but you just don't feel qualified. Maybe you want to make a very specific daring decision in your life, but you feel like you're not good enough. And that's something that plagues a lot of people. Um, but we would like to take that insecurity away tonight. So the question is, how do you make the choice to do something when you don't feel qualified? How do you make a daring decision when you yourself don't feel good enough, when you don't believe in yourself. Luckily, the Bible has something to say about it. It's the whole thing, <laughs> because uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of biblical characters deal with this, but one of my favorite characters in the entire Bible happens to have shining examples of this a lot in, in his specific life. Now, Moses, who we're talking about, had a lot of uh, decade-defining decisions because he led a lot of people over many decades, thus lots of decade-defining decisions. But uh, the one that I'd like to highlight is one of the first daring decisions that he had to make. So, in Exodus chapter 3, Moses by this point had been given up as a baby in a basket and floated down the river, raised to believe he was royal, uh, but then was told he was actually a part of the slave class. He murders someone, runs away, uh, becomes a shepherd, and lives a life out in the wilderness with his people. Classic young adult life stage type of things that we do. Now, here he is in this story where we find him. He's looking for his lost sheep. He's minding his own business on a mountain where people usually find God. He's looking for the sheep, and God shows up and says, hey, I heard that my people, and he lists all these different people all across the known world at the time, I heard that they're in trouble, and you, Moses, are going to go fix it. And his response in Exodus chapter 3, if you're interested in finding it, Exodus chapter 3, verse 11, but Moses says to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I'll be with you, and this will be a sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you've brought the people out of Egypt, you'll come back to this mountain. So Moses is not quite sure at this point, and he is talking to a burning bush after all. And <laughs> then he continues to argue with God. And then in the beginning of chapter 4, uh, this has been going on for a whole chapter, Moses answered, what if they do not believe me or listen to what I say? And they say, the Lord didn't appear to you. Moses keeps making excuses and it's all surrounded around like, what if they don't believe me? Or like, what if somebody else can do it? Or like, these people that I talk to, what if they don't quite understand? Like, Moses keeps making excuses and God keeps giving him miracle after miracle or different like ways to handle this. Blames it, Moses keeps blaming it on other people until finally the real truth comes out. 
the real reason why Moses doesn't want to do it, finally comes to light in chapter 4, verse 10. Moses says to the Lord, pardon your servant, Lord. I've never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you've spoken to your servant. Like, God, I've talked to the God of the universe and I still can't get my words together. I am slow of speech and tongue. The Lord said to him, who gave human beings their mouths? Who made them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go and I will help you speak and teach you what to say. This is one of my favorite passages in all of the Bible because just speaking personally, it reminds me of all the days that end with why. Because Moses is basically saying, and I think this probably it can't just be me, God, you are so good. You do really fantastic, great things, and I believe in you. I am the one who's going to mess this up. If you entrust this to me, I am not sure that I can take this all the way. I'm not sure that I am the right person for the job. I don't think I'm good enough. And God's response is something that I hope that we write into our hearts, get it tattooed on you somewhere, Post Malone style right here. No, I hope that we can etch it into our bones, really. God's response is, you're worried about your mouth? Who made your mouth? God essentially says, the same God, God, not me, you know what I'm saying. (laughs) In the story, God says to Moses, I made your mouth just like I made your miracles. I made your mouth and I made your miracles and I am going to be with you. I just wonder how many of us need to hear that because notice what the first thing, we didn't read it specifically, but if you look up what the first miracle that God does for Moses is, he, Moses is like, I can't do this. What if nobody believes me? He's like, see that staff in your hand? Throw it down and it's going to become a snake. The first thing that God does for Moses is points to whatever is in his hand and turns it into a miracle. My challenge for you this week, if this sounds like maybe part of why you are having trouble making a decade-defining, daring decision, what is God wanting to do with what's in your hand specifically? Not something that somebody else has, but you specifically, your first, middle, last name here, your life stage, your circumstance, your relationships, your blessings, your passions, what you have in your life, what does God want to turn that into a miracle with? Because our God can, and our God does, and our God wants to for you. Because sometimes making a daring decision is saying yes to God, even if you don't believe in yourself, because God believes in you. So as we talk about decade-defining decisions that are daring, not disastrous like we talked about the first week, or difficult like we talked about last week, but truly daring decisions, I think about all of the things that 2020 has had in store for me that I didn't see coming or that all of us didn't see coming. And I think about the rest of 2020, not that all of these crazy, insane problems across the globe are going to stop on December 31st at midnight (laughs) as soon as it becomes 2021. But I just think in my head, like, wouldn't it be so nice to just go into the rest of 2021, do a little scouting report, come back and tell me what I need to know so that the daring decisions staring me in the face right now I just like, I know a little bit of the backstory. I know what's coming. It would be so much easier for me to make a daring decision now if I knew what was coming. It reminds me of how one time um, in college I was reading, I don't remember when, because it's, or where, in what book, because it's been a hot minute since college. But (laughs) I remember reading that if you are the kind of person who like flips to the end of the book to read the end of the story because you can't handle the suspense of where you are in the book, um, you just need to know how it turns out. You probably struggle with anxiety because you need to know, and that Mm -hmm. resonated with me on such a deep level. Same thing with me in 2020. I just want to go to the end because my anxiety sometimes gets out of control roll and I just want to know what's happening. There's a story in the Old Testament just like this that I've been really chewing on this week and um, I can't wait to tell you about it. So in the Old Testament, right after this story that Chris was talking about where Moses did step into this daring decision to follow God and to trust God's leading and he ended up being the one who led the Hebrew people out of slavery under this intense Pharaoh. And so after that happens, the Hebrew people are wandering in the wilderness and they're wandering there for, was it a week? Was no. it was it a year? 
Somewhere around. Was it as long as seminary is going to (laughs) be? It was 40 (laughs) years. They wandered in the desert for 40 years. And so they knew that God had a promised land ahead of them that they weren't, they weren't just wandering aimlessly. Well, they kind of were, but they at least had an end goal of where they were going to. And so finally it came time um, for God to give them a peek. And so God told Moses, he's like, okay, Moses, Pick 12 people, one from all of the tribes of Israel, and send these 12 people to go scout out the land. Go see what's happening there. And um, so Moses 12 uh, chooses 12 people from each tribe, and he gives them very specific instructions. I love this. In Numbers chapter 13, he says, See what the land is like. Find out whether the people living there are strong or weak. There's a lot of them, or if there's very few. See what kind of land they live in. Is it good or bad? Are their towns fortified or are they like unprotected camps? Is the soil fertile or poor? Are there many trees? Do your best to bring back samples of the crops that you see. It just so happened to be the season for harvesting the first ripe grapes. So these 12 scouts go in and they scout all the way around and they um, basically they go high, they go low. They were everywhere that Dr. Seuss wants them to go. That's kind of what that sounded like, what that was turning into. And so then after a while, they come on back and they regroup and Moses gathers the assembly of all the, the Hebrew people and they hear the scouting report. And the scouts say, is it heaven or is it Iowa? <laughs> because they grow really good crops here. It's in the Bible. It's in the Bible. I quoted it. <laughs> no, but what they do, what the Bible does quote is there were big, um, oh gosh, I'm blanking, like a vine of grapes that the section of grapes was so big that yeah. two people had to carry them like yeah. on a pole between them, one clump of grapes, ginormous. So they show people the grapes. They bring back pomegranates and figs. I love how specific the Bible is. They bring back grapes, pomegranates, and figs. Promise Not land. apples. <laughs> We're no bites out of any apples no. in the promised land. And so they, 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 they show this excellent like crop production, but then they also say this. The scouts say it's not just these grapes that are huge. The people living there are huge. They're giants. They're giants from the descendants of Anak, which was a well-known giant. Goliath was in that same family of giants. So they say the whole land is full of giants. There is no way we can conquer them. We are weak. We are small. We are puny. We have been wandering in the, in the desert, in the wilderness for so long. And these, and these scouts whip up the people of Israel kind of into a frenzy. And, and they start weeping and they start wailing. And they say, Moses, which daring decisions as a leader means that you open yourself up as a vulnerable position to people criticizing you. That is a natural part of stepping into something daring. This is what happens to Moses. It happened to him on more than just this occasion. (laughs) It happened like every page in the Old Testament, basically. Uh, But so the people are like, Moses, why did you bring us out of Egypt? At least we had food there. At least we knew what our days contained. Yeah, they were slaves in Egypt, but they were like, we at least knew what our day to day was going to be like. Let's just go back to Egypt. So in the middle of all of this, there's a man that stands up. He was one of the 12 12 scouts that went out and his name is Caleb. And he stands up and he says, no, you guys, we can do this. Let's go take the land. God is with us. This is the promised land that God has promised to us. We are stepping into the future that God has for us. And the wailing just continues, and um, they continue to bemoan the fact to Moses that they don't know what they're doing, and they just want to go back, and they just want to go back, and it's so terrible. And so Moses and God end up intervening in this situation. And, um, and <laughs> But before I tell you what happens, I just want to stop for a moment and think, for all of us, for our daring decisions, for your daring decisions, have you ever had a moment like these Israelites who just have a hot mess express panic attack moment of like, can we just go back to the way that it was before, please? Like at least like this sucked and that sucked and that sucked, but at least I knew what that was entailing. Like that was known and all of this unknown 2020 is just wrecking me and I can't handle it. So before we say that the Israelite people here are like the worst ever, we are the Israelite people like all of the time. So Moses and God um, intervene and stand up and God highlights Caleb and then another one of the 12 scouts named Joshua. He says, you guys, they've got it. They want to lead into the promised land. They want to go. They see that there are big giants there. There are big challenges, but they know that this is what I have promised. God even very specifically says in Numbers 
14, 24, he says, but my servant Caleb has had a different attitude than the others have had. He's remained loyal to me, so I will bring him into the land that he explored. The rest of you will not enter and occupy the land that I swore to give you. The only exceptions will be Caleb, the son of Jepuna, and Joshua, the son of Nun. So Revive, I think about how relatable this story is to 2020. I wish I could send scouts into the rest of 2020 or into the rest of the years of my life where I'm going to be in seminary school. And I just wanna know what it's gonna look like so I can feel more confident making the daring decisions that I have to make in front of me. But that's where trust comes in. Trust that God is who God says God is and that God's got it. God's got the things that he's leading us into. So Revive, I don't know what daring decisions you feel like are in front of you, but I, I would invite you to consider are you going to be a Caleb or a Joshua when facing a daring decision? Or are you going to be like the Hebrew people, the Israelites, which that's the gravity of our human nature is to just freak out and say, this is too hard. I, we can't do it. And I think here's how you might know that God might be calling you into a daring decision. If you realize that there's a lot about your life that's really comfortable and there's something that you're feeling a nudge towards that's kind of uncomfortable, that's probably not just like you being uncomfortable. That's more like a holy discontent that you see something that's wrong. You see something that needs to change or you're feeling God's leading in your life, tugging you towards something. That's how you know that it might not just be a foolish decision. It might be a faithful decision. But here's the thing. For whatever decision you are facing, if you would like to talk to someone, reach out to any one of us. Reach out to a pastor at Any Hope um, campus or our care team. We are here for you to help you grow in your faith and your spiritual maturity, which is often it comes through making daring decisions. You don't usually grow in faith through sitting on your couch and like watching all of the other people make daring decisions and learning from them. You got to get in the game and you have to make some daring decisions, maybe mess up a little bit, go back and review the couple messages from the last couple of weeks, but, <laughs> but know that God has got you. So I think for all of the young adults who are watching this message, Revive, God has something incredible for us in 2020. There are some really plump grapes that God just can't <laughs> wait to lead us into and some really, really good things that God has in store. But if we just look at the giants and we say, we throw up our hands and we say, too hard, not going to do it. I think we're really missing out on so, so much. So are you going to be a Caleb or a Joshua or are you going to be one of... Um, the rest of the scouts? Or are you also going to be like Moses? Are you going to be like Ruth and Naomi? What is going to be the kind of daring decision that you decide to make? So like Chris said, our challenge for you is, as we wrap up this week, is, is what is God wanting to do with what's in your hand? Just like the very simple staff that Moses had in his hand. God can do anything with whatever it is that you have. So what is God wanting to do with what's in your hand to turn that into a miracle? And how does God want to call you further into trusting God's plan for you, not just in 2020, but as you grow into young adulthood and adulthood and all of the things that come next? So at that, I'd like to pray and we'll close. God, we thank you so much for the daring decisions that have led all of us to the place that we are today. God, I ask that as we face a daring decision, that you would help us to look back and see all of the daring decisions that you have led us through how you have helped us to navigate all of the, the difficult things that we've navigated to get to where we are today, and that that would build our faith and build our trust that you are who you say you are, that you've got us, and that the things that you have ahead of us are so much better than the things that we leave behind or that we're in right now. God, I ask that you would increase the faith of everyone who is hearing this prayer right now, that you would increase our trust in you, and that you would lead us into the promised things that you have for us. We love you, and we ask all these things in Jesus' name. And all God's kids gave a real rowdy. Amen. 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 We'll turn it over to worship, and then we have some killer announcements for you at the very end about Revive in person. Well, Revive, we invite you to join with us in worship. And as we are thinking about these decade-defining decisions, decisions that we have uh, to make, we are grateful that God steps in in such a powerful way. We believe in the power and the beauty in the name of Jesus. And we're grateful to him, and we know that it's through that power and through the presence of God that we can dare to step out. 
that we can dare to be bold and stand for him in brand new ways. So that's our goal is to let the Lord be our focus as we're stepping out into these new things. If there's a decision that you're trying to make, that you feel led to make, we want you to know that it's not by your power that this will be accomplished, but it's by the power of the Lord. Because we believe that we serve a powerful Jesus. He is the most powerful name, the most mighty name. And we sing of his name together. You were the word at the beginning, one with God, the Lord most high. You hid in glory in creation, now revealed in you our Christ. What a beautiful name it is. No rival, you have no ease. 
Jesus, thank you for being our light, 
God, thank you for being our light when we have really tough decisions to make, God. God, we praise you tonight because we know that when we say your name, Jesus, and we ask for your help, you will come to our rescue, God. God, as we're making difficult decisions, as we're making easy decisions, God, would you be with us through it all? Show us um, the path that you want us on, God. The path to you, the path to your light, the path to your kingdom, God. God, I pray that we can take others along our way and we can show them you and show them that light in your goodness and your mercy, Father. Thank you for being our rescuer. We love you so, so, so much. And we thank you for loving us in return. It's in your sons and your faith. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us for worship. We have a lot of really great things uh, coming up on the calendar. Yeah, so next week on Thursday, Revive is going to be outdoors at Greenwood Park in close to downtown Des Moines. We would love to have you come join us in person. Woo! It's been a long time since we've all been together in person and we're really excited to see you. So you can register, please register. It's actually required so we can practice safe social distancing. And that link will be on Hope's website on the Revive pages and also on our social media accounts. But it's Thursday, 7 p.m. at Greenwood Park. We're gonna post some directional videos on social media, but just know if you turn on 45th, 45th Street and go past the Art Center, just go till you see the Revive people. Turn left at the lake and you'll be good to go. So um, anyway, we hope to see you. Yay, and we have so many fun classes that you are invited to join as well. The first is Alpha, and if you've already taken Alpha, you can take After Alpha. So Alpha and After Alpha both begin this Sunday, so there's still time to register, but register. Alpha is really great if you are exploring your faith or want to dive deeper and you just have some questions. You get put in a small group. It's a really excellent course. Um, and After Alpha is if you've already taken Alpha and you want to dive even deeper than what you learned in Alpha, and that's a really cool online uh, Zoom format that is, I, I'd encourage you to check it out if you haven't. And we have School for Listening Prayer coming up, and I don't know the exact registration date, like when it starts, but you can still register. It's in a couple weeks, I promise. But register if you wanna dive deeper into your prayer life. That's an amazing class. Uh, it's impacted my prayer life uh, immensely, and so I invite you to check that out as well. Yeah, now it's been a really difficult year for a lot of people, but one of the things that we as a church have done is partnered with our missions partner, Habitat for Humanity. And over the last year, even before all of this craziness with 2020, we've uh, been partnering with Habitat for Humanity to rebuild some houses in the Des Moines uh, neighborhood there, specifically for some families that really need it. And guess what? Those families still need those houses, regardless of what's going on outside of those circumstances. And so we have continued to serve with them. This is a great opportunity for your small groups, for your friends, for your family. Uh, we can You can sign up online. They've adjusted a lot of the house building projects to uh, adhere to social distancing and a lot of the safety guidelines there. So you can find out more information and sign up at lutheranchurchofhope.org slash habitat. Yep. And then I'm going to tell you a little bit about small groups. But before I forget, all of these announcements that we've talked about so far with classes and habitat are great small group opportunities. Mm -hmm. If you take alpha, you get put in a small group. Oftentimes those people continue as that small group. So if you're looking for a small group, those are also good options in addition to what I'm about to tell you. So we have interest-based small groups here at Revive West Des Moines, and we have a couple that are launching this month. So if you wanna get into a small group, if you're not currently in a small group, just email revive at hopewdm.org and we can plug you in. We'll also be putting um, some details on our social media accounts to make sure that you follow those. Like, for example, this past Sunday, we have a new movie watching and discussing uh, small group. And so they just went to watch Jurassic Park and um, they have some other movies coming soon. So make sure that you follow us on social media and then email revive at hopewgm.org if you want to get into a small group. That's all for announcements. We hope to see you next week at Outdoor Revive. <laughs>